Hi everyone, my name is Petra Dita. Today we're going to be talking about equal shared parenting time with um, the board chair of the National Parents Organization. Uh, we have today with us um, our guest, Dr. Don Huben. Don, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, you are from the National Parents Organization. Would you um, please, I mean like our audience are mostly alienated parents. Would you talk about how equal parenting time is relating to parental alienation? You know, how does that help or not help with what we're trying to do? Sure, Petra. First, thanks for having me on. Um, National Parents Organization's primary focus is on promoting equal shared parenting when the parents live apart from one another. But many of the parents that come to us uh, are experiencing parental alienation. And so we've been working with a collaborative of organizations to try to address some of the misconceptions about parental alienation. We think it, uh, the, the, the battle against parental alienation fits very well with our core mission. What we're really trying to do is to keep both parents fully involved and engaged in their children's life because that's what research shows is best for children. One of the ways in which equal shared parenting uh, connects with parental alienation is this. I mean, it's not a guarantee that there won't be parental alienation. Parental alienation could even happen in an intact couple if one parent really was trying to turn the children against the others. But it is much easier for a parent to alienate uh, the children from another parent if that other parent has been sort of sidelined into an every other weekend uh, um, uh, relationship with the children, because that means that one parent really is sort of the primary parent and the children's relationship with the other parent gets filtered through that parent. So it's easier to play those sorts of loyalty games. So we think that when we really establish equal shared parenting as the, the pattern that most couples do when they're living apart, it will diminish uh, the incidence of parental alienation. Uh, thank you. Um, Jose, hi. Jose is calling in from New Hampshire and uh, someone's calling in from Bowen City. Uh, Norman, hi, thank you. And Tia is talking about she's calling in from uh, Ireland and how she even have recording of how, you know, her ex is lying to the kids. And But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a big problem. And you're right, you know, like when a parent is being put on the side and doesn't have access to the children, that's just the, just the perfect opportunities for the alienators who now really, I mean, that's the point of, of this is kind of, of abuse, right? One aspect of abuse is isolation. Isolate the child from the other environment where the child get a chance to see and expose to how loving the other parents is, you know, the, that side of the family. And yeah, that's so true. So, um, so national parents organization, so this is one of um, the organization main initiatives, right? Um, mm -hmm. Would you talk to us about what National Parent or National Parents Organization is? So we are an almost all volunteer organization. All the members of the board, all of the chapters leader, chapter leaders are, are entirely volunteers. We have chapters now in 29 states and we have uh, um, followers uh, in, you know, across the country. Um, so we are the largest uh, shared parenting organization um, and we are the most effective shared parenting organization as well. So we increasingly we're trying to emphasize that the, um, the, the objective of getting shared parenting is not just about changing the laws, although that's a very important part of it. So I often talk not just about changing the laws, but about reforming the norms because um, while legal changes, statutory changes are very important, and, and we led the charge to get an equal shared parenting law in Kentucky. Um, it's now been in place for three years, and it's very successful. It's very popular, and, and it's working very well. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't still some sad stories from Kentucky. There are still some judges that aren't really following the law, or they're using their discretion uh, to, to limit some parents uh, inappropriately. But many, many more parents are getting equal parenting in, in Kentucky. So changing the laws is one part of it, but we also need to change the, the, uh, the beliefs and perceptions of judges and other divorce professionals because any statute that will be passed will allow judges some discretion. 
Um, and if judges aren't on board with shared parenting, they'll use that discretion sometimes to inappropriately limit it. So uh, we think that judicial education, educating attorneys, uh, educating uh, custody evaluators and so forth is also really important. And we work on that as well. And finally, there's, a, there's really just a public education issue here because if parents understood how important shared parenting was to the well-being of their children. And if they could be encouraged to set aside their own personal emotions when they're going through a divorce, and those emotions are very strong. People are sometimes, they're frightened, they're humiliated, they're angry. Um, there, there are a whole flood of, of emotions, and it's very easy to confuse your anger or hostility with what's best for the children. But if parents were educated to see how important shared parenting is for children, then we would shared parenting would be a norm even if we didn't change the laws. I mean, every single uh, courtroom in America would be inclined to order shared parenting if both parents went in and said that's what we want. So we're really trying to, to do the public education, the education of divorce professionals, and legislative change as well. So that's really multi-layered, like that's a lot of things that you're trying to do, um, trying to sort of attack it from multi-angles, right? Um, hi, Victoria, she's calling from Australia. That's that's amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that you're ahead of us, a day ahead of us, and you're morning there. Okay, and um, yeah, someone was, uh, Winnie was talking about, I was in court yesterday, and the judge tried to put it in his ruling. So share parenting time, is that what you were talking about? Um, oh. Is, um, is the quality of the call okay? Um, someone just said that it's cutting in and out. Can you guys let me know? Um, and then uh, Jose is sharing his story. And Bobby, hi, Bobby's from New York. Um, and Greece, we have someone calling from Greece. So uh, it looks like you're going to have to expand your organization internationally because you have <laughs> callers really from everywhere. Well, Petra, we are uh, a, a supporting organization of the International Council on Shared Parenting, and I'm on the board of the International Council of Shared Parenting. And so we do work with other organizations in other countries. And one of the things that, that you find when you engage in that kind of international interaction is that while the actual uh, legal system is different in different countries and how you would change the court system changes from different countries, the fundamental problems are the same. And of course, the research on what's best for children cuts across national borders. It's not as if, you know, both parents are important to their children in one country, but not in another country. And so we are working through the International Council on Shared Parenting to share research and to share strategies on promoting shared parenting around the world. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, and Cynthia is calling in from Massachusetts. We have Selma from Blind. And um, I'm curious, actually, parents, you are in the, in the chat room. Um, how many of you have have heard of National Parents Organization before? I'm, I'm curious. Um, so let's kind of unpack a little bit because you, you covered a lot of things. Um, so we talk about less, um, you know, changing the law, and then we talk about um, education, sort of changing the norm in the professional, which is the judges and you know the lawyers and all that, and then the general public awareness for the parents. So they, you know, at least there's three layers that I could see there, right? So let's talk about the the law aspect first um you said that you um the organization have been successful in kentucky um and you would have thought that i mean for me anyway i would have thought that the law would naturally uh, there would be a presumption of equal parenting time uh, everywhere so could you tell us what is the status of that um at least in the u.s or, or anywhere so um, many people who have not been involved with the family court system or haven't had someone close to them involved with the family court system assumes that equal parenting is what's going to happen. And we hear, of course, about, uh, you know, celebrity couples who have, like Gwyneth Paltrow, who, who are very concerned about, you know, conscious uncoupling and doing what's best for kids and all of that. And, and actually, I just read a story yesterday about Adele, who is separated from her husband, and they've agreed to equal parenting and, and so forth. Um, so we hear those stories and people think that's what happens most of the time or even automatically, but that's not true. Um, if you're interested in what the statutes say in different states, go to National Parents Organization's website. It's, a, it's easy to remember, just sharedparenting.org. 
um, and look under our research and our, our work, I think, is the, is the label. And you can see the uh, NPO shared parenting report card which we did first in 2014 and then again in 2019 to grade all of the states on their shared parenting statutes. And you'll find that there are only two in the A range. Uh, Kentucky is one and uh, Arizona is the other. Um, in, in 2014, Kentucky had a D minus. So um, if your state scores poorly, there is hope because Kentucky went from a D minus to an A. They, they really are the national leader in this. Um, but in, in most states, uh, there is no presumption that there is going to be equal parenting time. In fact, in many states, it specifically says there's no presumption in favor of any particular parenting time. Yeah. So a number of states say that they have a presumption in favor of joint custody. But what they mean by that is joint legal custody. And that means decision-making authority. So after you divorce, both parents have the right to access medical records and school records and things like that. But, um, but in, in very few states are there presumptions about parenting time, and even the ones that do don't come close to equal parenting time. Minnesota, for example, has a presumption that uh, each parent will get at least 25% of the parenting time. But that works out to be just every other weekend and a few weeks in the summer and half of the holidays. It doesn't work out to, to both parents being really actively engaged in the ordinary parenting of children. So um, I'd encourage people, if, if you want to know something about the laws in your state, go to NPO's website, sharedparenting.org, and look at the, that research. And, and for each state, we have um, a list of the positives and the negatives in the state and what the state would need to do to its laws to improve. Uh, you know what, uh, why don't you go ahead um, and, you know, do you want to pull that and just share that screen, at, the, at least sure. that way we uh, take the time and I'm going to just kind of run through some of the comments here. Um, you know, we have Norman um, um, and Suzette, let's see, um, okay, Suzette said, yes, important since my daughter is half sweet and a lot of the coercion happens there in summer and I've been trying to work with the consultant. Um, Okay, so there's a few people um, in the chat room said that it's their first time hearing about national uh, parents organizations. So yeah, you go ahead and pull the, the screen um, and share it and then, um, okay, and then... Um, uh, Can you see my screen now? Yes, okay, great, go ahead. Yeah. So this is our website here, and uh, if, you, if you go up under work, you'll see research. It's one of the items. And the top item on our research is our shared parenting report card. So this is just a description of the shared parenting report card. But one thing, one very uh, useful uh, um, element here is our interactive map. So I'm going to open it in a separate tab here. So this is a map of the country showing the grades that each of the state the states get. And when you mouse over your state, um, let's see, we said uh, someone was from Massachusetts, I think, listening. Uh, right, so yes. You mouse, yeah. So you mouse over it, and it'll say what the positives are um, and what the negatives are for that state and what the grade is overall. Um, we also have handouts from each of the states, uh, a one-page, you know, two-sided handout that people can give to their legislators to explain you know, what the uh, issues are in that particular state. Kentucky is the only state that gets a, a straight A. Um, there, uh, there, there's only one problem we find with the, the um, Kentucky statutes, and that is that they don't uh, include a court-based way of dealing with false allegations of abuse. So, of course, in every state, uh, false testimony, uh, false uh, filings that are signed could be dealt with using contempt actions, but those never happen. Um, I remember asking our county prosecutor, I'm in Ohio, in the largest county, in the most populous county in Ohio, I asked our prosecutor some time ago, when the last time anyone was prosecuted for contempt of court, for lying to the court um, about, uh, for, I'm sorry, for perjury, excuse me, for uh, perjury uh, in Franklin County in family court. And he had been the, the prosecutor for 20 years, and he said, I don't think there's ever been a case. 
Um, that doesn't mean that no one lies in family court. It means that no one uses the perjury, that the, the, the prosecutors won't use perjury. So we think that the family courts ought to have a family court-based way of addressing false allegations. And some states do. What they do is say, if you make a false allegation of abuse, if it's shown to be false, not it's not if there's a you know misunderstanding, but if it's shown to be a false allegation, that counts against you in custody decisions. And so that that's that's the only problem we found with Kentucky. Kentucky has a presumption of equal parenting time in the temporary orders and in permanent orders. So people can go you know over their state and see what the positives are and what the negatives are, um, and how they score them. So, uh, so parents, you can just go to the uh, shareparenting.org, right? Yes, shareparenting.org. And then you can um, you can just go to this interactive map that it will show every state. Would you mind? So, someone in the, the chat room asked if he could show if you could show Maryland. Um, so, parents, yes. you can go to a particular state, and then that will pop up and give you the information about that state. I think this is really useful for parents to. To be aware because you know awareness is definitely the first step in preparing your case um okay so so maryland that is rated d minus is that minus. right wow okay uh could you talk about that a little bit what is this about maryland so um you know we, we did the study two years ago so i don't have it in my memory but i i, I you know from from this the, the one positive there is in maryland is that its statutes explicitly allow a court to award shared joint custody, joint physical custody. And if you look here, the two states that get an F, that's New York and Rhode Island, they don't even they don't even have statutes that allow a court to award joint custody. Now, that doesn't mean that a court can't do it in those states. The, the courts can do it, but it's only because higher level courts have authorized that. Um, the, the legislatures of these two states, New York and Rhode Island, have never passed a law that even enact, even enables a court to do shared parenting. So Maryland does allow shared parenting, and that's why it moved from it moved out of the F range. But it got a D minus because there is no other positive here. There's no statutory preference or presumption of shared parenting. Um, they don't uh, uh, explicitly provide for shared parenting during temporary orders, and that's such an important thing because when couples separate, um, the the courts in many states will often award sole custody to one parent, usually the parent that stays in the marital residence, and the other parent gets shuttled off to the sidelines, the every other weekend model. And the court proceedings can go on for a year, a year and a half, two years, sometimes much more, but courts try to, to settle them fairly quickly, but often it's 18 months anyway. And that sets a pattern for parenting. And it, it you know, 18 months may not sound like a long time to uh, adults and to the court that deals with this all this time, but 18 months for a five-year-old, that's a huge amount of time. Right. And, and then the other, the other problem with not having uh, shared physical custody during temporary orders is that if the parent that gets temporary sole custody wants to have sole custody permanently, then that parent is put in the position of just defending the status quo. And the other parent has to come in and say, we want the court to take a bet on a parenting arrangement that they haven't seen operate and make that their permanent order. And courts are often reluctant to do that. They think, well, if the kids are doing reasonably well, that's not rock the boat is the way they think. So temporary orders are very important. And, and I will say something strategically here about um, how you can um, uh, move legislation in your state. Um, Kentucky followed the strategy of first getting a presumption of tempor of equal parenting during temporary orders while the court ca case is uh, working its way through the court. And the argument there was, well, don't take one of the parents out of a full parenting role before you've even had a chance to look at the case, right? Um, and so that passed their legislature with no negative votes by Democrats or Republicans. So it's completely bipartisan, but no negative votes. And then a year later, they came back with a bill that uh, created a, a presumption of equal parenting for permanent orders. And that passed both houses of their legislature with only two negative votes because the, the temporary orders bill had established this as a very popular way to go. So, um, so are you saying this, is a, this was a two-year process 
because you know one year to introduce a temporary bill and then the next year to no. wow okay um so do you have um people that are working to push the temporary bill right now with other states around the country we are and we're also working to, to push because some states are trying to go straight to the permanent uh, bill, it, you know, the, the, the political landscape is different in different states. Um, so uh, sometimes it might be feasible only to get a temporary uh, bill through. Sometimes you can get the permanent bill through. Sometimes it's not feasible to get a presumption of equal parenting through, but you can move the presumption up from 25% to 40%. And, you know, we, you know, we have our end goal in mind. But we also realize that you can take steps to get there. So Kentucky did it in one giant leap, but there are other states that are doing it step by step, and they're getting there too. So Claudia in the chat room is asking about um, your thought about the current bill HB 803, Equal Share Parenting Bill in Texas. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, I mean, specific states and specific bills that are going on. I'm sure there's a lot of things going on. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry, we actually we track all of these things. We keep track of all the bills that are introduced and, and we review a lot and give feedback on a lot. Um, but I can't keep in mind, I, I, I couldn't yeah. speak specifically to the Texas bill. Although, um, Petra, I'd be happy to have you share my email address with, uh, with, with this person and, and they can contact me and I can, uh, I can you know, have a chance to take a look at the bill again. I'm sure I've given comments to our uh, our NPO affiliate in Texas about the bill, but I don't remember off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I understand. And then you also mentioned that um, uh, for each state, parents can also get a, a single uh, sheet, information uh, sheet for the yeah. state. Uh, where would they get that? Let me, let me show you how to do that. Yeah. So um, when we, if you under about, it'll have our state chapters and you can go to the state, and so going to Texas here, uh, it has a link to our um, chapter there, the name of our uh, state chair and, the, and link to the chapter. And then it, it repeats the positives and the negatives for the state. But then there's a report card that you can download, Excellent. send as a PDF or print. Oh, for very each state. good. Very good. Okay. So parents, you, this is something that you could get. Um, you can just go to shareparenting.org and get yep. this information for your state. Uh, the state chapters, you can get that. There's something else I want to share, um, Petra. I mentioned earlier that we are um, uh, collaborating with a, with really a bunch of groups that are focused on parental alienation. Um, one of the one of the hallmarks of national parents organizations is that we really are a research driven organization. Um, so, you know, we, we present a lot of research on a lot of issues here, like um, uh, shared parenting uh, for, um, for infants and toddlers. And when there's high parental conflict, I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, as you know, Petra, we've been, we've been working together with a group to get some handouts on to, to um, uh, educate people about some of the myths about uh, parental alienation. So we have links to those handouts here. Um, we also have links to articles, including the terrific article by uh, by Jennifer Harmon and um, uh, and Demosthenes Lorandos uh, here. Some of these, unfortunately, are behind a paywall. So you'll just get to the um, to the publisher's website, and to actually get the article, you have to uh, you have to pay for it. But uh, but uh, professors uh, Harmon and Dr. Lorandos have uh, made their article available free, so there's a link here. But we also have um, articles here on uh, issues connected uh, directly with shared parenting. Here's one of the things, one of the myths that people uh, often believe about shared parenting: that shared parenting is great when both parents agree to it and voluntarily want to have it and so forth, but it doesn't make sense if there's parental conflict. So we have a whole section here about articles about uh, the, the value of shared parenting, even when there's parental conflict. And, and of course, some of the best research there, here is done by Linda Nielsen, um, who's done a meta study of, I think she's up to about 70 different studies that show that um, even when parents are in conflict and even when they're in in particular in conflict about whether to do shared parenting, it's still better for kids. 
And sometimes people say, well, shared parenting uh, may be fine for older kids, but younger kids really need to have just a single home and they can visit the other parent. And so we have a section here on on uh, shared parenting with infants and toddlers. The research shows that infants and toddlers do just fine. And, and really that's something that almost anyone knows. There are people who, you know, their, their children may spend uh, a night or two a week with grandma and grandpa, you know, um, uh, and, and, and those children benefit from that. So um, we, have, we have a lot of research here that uh, can help people. And we are increasing our, um, our section on help for parents. Um, we have, this is something that we're building out now to deal with specific problems that parents have, like uh, move aways. The other parent wants to, wants to move the children away from you, or um, how you can avoid litigation through mediation and, and collaborative law and, and things like that. So there's a lot of help here for parents, although this is something that is still under construction. There are a number of these pages where it says more to come. Um, oh, excellent. So, um... So yeah, so if you go to resources, you can get um, information for parents. So that's that's excellent. So um, is this the part of um, what you were talking about in terms of uh, raising public awareness and education? Yes, yes, yep. Uh, what else do you do in terms of public uh, education? Well, we, um... We're, we're probably the only shared parenting organization that really uh, works on getting op-ed articles published. Um, a number of the people from our board and our chapter leaders have written op-ed articles because, you know, we have a blog, but the blog, uh, frankly, is mostly read by people who already support shared parenting. So it, it educates them about what's going on in shared parenting. But in order to, to, to not just be preaching to the choir or, you know, talking to the already converted, um, you know, it's important to, to publish op-eds about shared parenting. So we, when, when there's legislation pending in the state, um, we'll work on getting op-eds published in the newspapers. And then once they're published, we work on getting people uh, uh, going on to the, to the web page and commenting on the web page and supporting their articles. So that's another part of the parental education. We also have uh, published um, the, uh, hang on one second, I just want to find it here. We, uh, we co-sponsored with the International Council on Shared Parenting a conference in uh, 2017 in Boston on shared parenting, which is uh, brought together really the, the, the world leading researchers on shared parenting uh, at, at, at the time here. And we have provided 20 of those videos uh, to everyone for free from okay. our website. And actually that, uh, you can go to that site directly if you go to uh, sharedparenting.net. Our main site is sharedparenting.org, but sharedparenting.net, we have um, uh, talks by uh, Michael Lamb, by Sanford Braver, uh, by uh, Linda Nielsen, uh, William Fabricius, uh, Richard Warshock. Um, th these are really, and Jennifer Harmon, these really are the, the, the leading researchers in this area, and these are all available to people for free. Oh wow, that's great! That's that's so much resources. So yeah, so and these are all the I I can see it really critical topics like you know about well joint parenting, soul custody, um, parental alienation. I could see yeah, that's that's amazing. So parents, you can actually go there and get um, watch all these videos for free. Um, and a lot of the research don't change. I mean, this is in two thousand seventeen, but these are scientific fundamental research that don't change. I mean. Um, we are still talking about a very real um, and relevant social and uh, family dynamic issues here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the research is is really speaking as uh, you know, as uniquely as you know, with one voice um, as social science research ever does. I mean, the, the overwhelming body of research supports the value of equal shared parenting. In fact, there's a there's a paper on our uh, that, that we we link to. Um, I believe we have it up here. Um, perhaps we don't have it up yet. I'll, I'll, I'll check and see. I'm not seeing it right away. But a, a very recent paper by uh, uh, William Fabricius uh, from Arizona State University that um, speaks to the, the uh, value of 
equal shared parenting. A lot of times people say, and, and I've often said in the past, what's really important, and, and this is true, but what's really important is that both parents are involved in the day-to-day child-rearing activities that really constitute parenting. But, but um, some people think, well, it doesn't matter whether it's really equal. I mean, 40-60 would be okay. But uh, Bill Fabricius's work shows that uh, a presumption of equal parenting is beneficial to children, that it, that it reassures the children that they're not going to lose one of their parents. Um, and so it's, it, it, it's really important symbolically. We might say, what difference does it make if it's exactly equal or not equal? But it reinforces to the children that they have two parents who are continue, going to continue to be equally involved in their, in their lives. So, um, yeah, there's, there's some really good research here. And if we, if we don't have Bill Fabricius's article, recent article up here, Uh, there uh, and also I think another the person that from Greece also share this thank you so much you guys for sharing if you're not comfortable sharing this in your personal Facebook page maybe just share it in the groups that you are in the private Facebook groups or something because uh, we want these resources to go out to as many parents out there as possible um, and uh, and yeah a lot of people in the chat room are talking about you know thank you for the resources because th that was really great that you're showing of this um, so um, Suzette was asking about, are there any bills that you know of that talk about accountability uh, for, you know, who contributed the most to, I guess, alienating behavior um, and that kind of thing? I'm sorry, um, I'm not sure I understand. What's... Are there any bills that you are aware of that talk about accountability on, you know, who, which parent is contributing to word parental alienation? Well, um... Both fathers and mothers can be alienators and both can be alienated um, because uh, about 80 to 85 percent of the time when there's a sole custody award, it is a sole custody award to mom. Uh, it's probably the case that, uh, that fathers, I mean it is the case, the researchers say it is the case that fathers are more likely to be the victims of parental alienation, not because moms are, are, are more, you know, um, inclined to be alienators, but they're more they're more able to have the opportunity to do it. Um, but but it is important to underscore that that both moms and dads can be victims of this. And um, if I don't know if uh, if people watching have uh, seen uh, Ginger Gentile's film A Racing Family, you'll see she focuses on cases where moms were alienated and cases where dads were alienated uh, from the kids. Um, one of the things I didn't mention when we were talking about the state laws is that uh, Kentucky, when it got its equal parenting law through, it, um, it also revised the factors that are used for uh, determining custody if, uh, if, if shared parenting doesn't work, maybe because the parents live, you know, 300 miles away or, or, or for some other reason. Um, and one of the factors is the wishes of the children but what they added to that was um, if there's, uh, un unless there's evidence of inappropriate uh, parental um, manipulation, I can't, maybe it's not manipulation, but something like that, they tried to get in the word parental alienation and they couldn't get that through the legislature. But they're really speaking to this case where one of the parents really tries to coach the children to say, I don't want to be with the other parent. And, and as you know, Petra, there are now some very good diagnostic tools to determine whether or not a child's reluctance to be with one of the parents is the result of some real problem between the child and the parent, or it's a matter of parental alienation. Um, and and um, the, it's interesting, the research is counterintuitive, as, uh, as William Burnett, who's one of the leading researchers on, on this, uh, said, in his uh, presentation to the uh, International Council on Shared Parenting Conference this last uh, December, it's a counterintuitive consequence that the, the children who are most adamant that they don't want to be with the other parent, who are, uh, ab they see the two parents absolutely in black and white terms, those are the ones that are most likely to have been subjected to a campaign of parental alienation. If there's actually abuse between a child and a parent, the children are conflicted. They, they, they they don't want to be abused, but they make excuses. They they blame themselves for it or something like that. So it, there really are tools for determining 
whether or not it's parental alienation. And um, it would be good if we had parental alienation actually written into the statutes. But short of that, having something that, that speaks directly to the possibility of the children being coached or manipulated um, is an important step. Yeah, that's that's a that's a challenge right now is to get um, the law to recognize parental alienation because, like you said, I mean we had so many um, interviews with experts here on victim 2 uh, and there's a lot of this discussion about how counterintuitive it is, like you talk about, and we talk also a lot about the five factor model to prove parental alienation that really examine the dy dynamic of the whole family and examine everyone's behavior, not just, you know, blaming one parent or claiming whatever. Um, but for some reason, we are still facing such challenge to get the law to recognize the, the real problem. And I think part of it, um, uh, and I mean, you, both you and I are aware of, is that there's a sort of a push um, that is going against what we're trying to do because of, and you touched on this a little bit, of this sort of um, narrative out there about a gender bias. Um, do you want to touch on this a little bit about, you know, how this, there's this misleading study and also information out there that really not helping parents? Yeah, so um, there is a uh, push uh, from some quarters to try to delegitimize de um, claims of parental alienation. In particular, they, they uh, quite explicitly say that uh, parental alienation is pseudoscience and that um, it is just a tool that is used by abusive parents to wrest control of, uh, of abused children from the mothers who are trying to protect them. And these people really paint the, the parental alienation thing um, in gendered terms, I mean exclusively. They treat it as if the only victim, the, the only alleged victims of parental alienation are men, and, and it's always to wrest custody from the mothers. That's just absolutely not true. The research shows it's not true. Um, and um, uh, the, um, they also treat it as if, uh, and they, they explicitly say things, that um, parental alienation is, um, is, is this tool used by abusers. But of course, um, no serious parental alienation researcher has said that there aren't legitimate cases of um, child abuse or that uh, the, the child abusers should have access to their children except under supervised conditions, right? The, 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 the question is whether there are also false allegations of abuse used to try to alienate the other parent. And really no serious researchers should deny that there are those false allegations either. So um, unfortunately, there is, a, um, there is a movement by, uh, by some people um, and you know the research that came out of uh, Joan Meyer and her group um, to really try to delegitimize um, parental alienation. And that is uh, um, gaining some traction around the world. As I understand it, in Portugal, there's a, there's a bill that would, uh, that would preclude people from raising uh, parental alienation in courts. And, and this is something we've talked about with our, with our um, sister organizations in, in, in Europe. Uh, they're all confronting this. Fortunately, we have this research from uh, Professor Harmon and, and Dr. Landros, uh, Landros, um, and uh, it really undermines that study by, uh, by Jane, uh, by Joan Meyer and her colleagues. And we're doing what we can to get the word out about the, the, the research on this. Yeah, it, it's really unfortunate. And um, I mean, when I started this work, I really wanted to just focus on bringing resources for parents. And my, my perspective was that if you are an alienated parent, you don't have the luxury to wait for the law to change, for the system to change. So I was trying to really focusing on okay, what can we do within the framework of this broken system? Like, what are the resources? How do parents cope with their own situation provided the system the way it is? But as I'm, I'm working on this, I, I've noticed that, unfortunately, the, the opposing side, um, and perhaps because of a, a, a lack of understanding, is really pushing 
things in a way that they are actually changing the system really fast in a way that really damaging for alienated parents. And um, and if we are not aware of this, um, this problem can get really serious very quickly. Like you talk about, there are countries that we, we know now that they manage to change the law to the point that parents cannot at all get any resources or support or recognition in court when they run into a parental alienation problem. We, we saw that the APA changed their position on what parental alienation parental alienation was, even though at one point they recognized that parental alienation is child psychological abuse, they now change their position. And then the same with, um, let's see, uh, APSAT, the American Society for Professional Child, I'm sorry, I don't remember the whole name, but it's about child abuse. And again, the same thing, they also change their position on parental alienation and try to say that they don't recognize that anymore. And that's very serious because these are the organizations that have impact on how lawmakers make decisions because they're making decisions based on professional opinions. And if professionals don't recognize it, then the lawmakers can't just say, oh, we're going to recognize it anyway. Right. So that's the problem is um, and if parents can recognize and be aware that uh, these people are trying to push, they're trying to protect, and I understand it, they're trying to protect the potential of an abuser using the term parental alienation, misuse it and abuse the system. Uh, but the problem is you can talk about any kind of abuse and you're going to have the perpetrator using that term and misuse that term and pretend to be the victim. Right. You always have that situation. It doesn't you, you don't even have to talk about parental alienation. You can talk about physical violence, any kind. Of, there's going to be the abuser that's going to use the term and pretending to be the victim. It, it's happened anywhere. But what I think the problem is to to then shut down what is real, which is parental alienation is a real problem, to shut it down and say, oh, this doesn't exist. We cannot use this because it's going to be misused. Then you're shutting down all the victims, the real victims out there, right? And um, and that's very serious. Instead of trying to shutting down the what is real, I think it should be, they should be pushing for um, better diagnostic tools better method, better education, so that professionals out there, the system out there can recognize when it's being misused. Um, and that's, that's, yeah, go ahead. I think you're well, I was going to say, absolutely, that's right. And, and there's a lot of education that needs to be done here. One of the things we need to educate uh, the people in the, in the family law about is that there's no fail-safe position here. I mean, the idea of fail-safe is you, you design something so that if it fails, it doesn't cause any harm. And I think there's a tendency for people to think, well, you know, if there's even an allegation of abuse, then we should just, you know, make sure that that parent is anywhere near the kid because that's a, they think of that as a fail safe position, but it's not fail safe because it's depriving the child of the relationship with that parent. And if it's false, if the allegation of abuse is false, then you're harming the child by doing that. So that's why we need the better diagnostic tools you're talking about, because we can't just say better safe than sorry, because, you know, um, separating a child from the parent is not a fail safe position. And the other thing I, I, advise people about is given the way the laws are and given that there are some judges we know who don't want to hear the word parental alienation i'll give some advice that a very uh, fine attorney uh, once gave in a, in a meeting i had with a, with a group of divorced parents he said you know i always tell people let the facts do the heavy lifting don't come into court with your conclusions because judges are lawyers and lawyers are trained to be adversarial and when you come in and state a conclusion, they their their shields go up. They say, "What's the evidence for that? How do you establish etc." If you go in and say, "Here's what happened," right? Here's what the other parents said to my kids, you know, in front of me about me. Don't say she's an alienator. He's an alienator. Don't say you know he's got borderline personality disorder. She's got you know she's a narcissistic disorder. Don't come in with a conclusion state the, the, the facts and let them draw the conclusion. And maybe they don't frame it in terms of parental alienation. Maybe they frame it in terms of uh, inappropriate influence on the child or some, whatever, whatever they call it. But you can lead them to the right conclusion in that way. Um, and, and I think a lot of times people come in presenting the conclusions 
and then they get pushback from the from the lawyers and from the uh, from the from the judges. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you're having this problem and you have an attorney, you may need to educate your attorney because not all attorneys understand this. Not all attorneys know about the five factor model for determining this or what the evidence of parental alienation is, and so you'll have to educate your attorney. Um, yeah, for parents that are in the middle of a custody situation or you are about to, I highly recommend you watching the interview that we actually just did yesterday with attorney Ashish Joshi, where we talk a lot about, I mean, this is our, this was our second time interviewing attorney um, Joshi, but we really dig deep into how do you fight, what the strategy, what are the framework, uh, what to focus on. So, um, and, and definitely I agree, evidence and, you know, like providing fact is very important in that. But yeah, really, if you are fighting in court, please watch that video. It's still available on our Facebook page. It's going to be on our website as well. Um, yeah, definitely, whether you're fighting pro se or if you're fighting with a lawyer, definitely watch that. Um, so, so John, um, uh, actually, one of the questions earlier I saw, I think Car Carrie was asking, do you actually have the bills included on your website? Like, can parents go to different states and see the bills? Uh, we don't have the bills uh, okay. published on our website. Oh, no. okay. Um, actually, um, sometimes it turns out to be better not to advertise the bills really widely because it just signals to some of these misguided opponents that there is a battle to be fought there. So we, we track them, we work with the people who are advocating them with the legislators, but we don't, we don't uh, publish all of that. Right, right. Okay. Um, and then the other thing um, I really wanted to, to ask you is that, I mean, we talk about um, we talk about what the organization do, which is you know trying to change the law, and then the research that you that your organization does, as well as um, bringing awareness to parents and the resources for parents. What about um, the the very big part of it is education for professional, like you know judges and lawyers and therapists. Uh, how are you doing this? Like, I always find that so important because a lot of pa uh, professionals don't know. And, I mean, you just talk about that. Lawyers, a lot of them don't even know what parental alienation is, or if they do, they misunderstand it, or they don't have enough understanding about it. So, could you could you talk about like how do you reach these people? So at this point, it's fairly informal, though the, the, the conference we did in 2017 attracted a lot of uh, family law lawyers. But um, we, we would like to develop uh, a series of continuing legal education uh, courses. Um, that turns out to be a, uh, a steeper hill to climb than we uh, first thought. I mean, you have to do it state by state. You to have an attorney in the state to uh, make a proposal to their uh, their court system. Usually this is handled by the Supreme Court, whether you can get uh, credit for continuing legal education. Now, we believe we have the resources from our uh, conferences that we've done and recorded the presentations uh, to put together a really uh, a really strong continuing legal education uh, course. And, and that is on our horizon, something we want to do, but we've not been able to do that yet. So, um, so it's not the problem with putting the content together, right? You have the right. content. You have okay. the content, yes. Um, I do know because there's at least one of the parents in the chat room right now, she's trying to work at, she's working on trying to put together that curriculum. Um, so mm -hmm. I, yeah, I will um, give her your contact information and then sure. she could probably, yeah. Um, so, okay, so that that, um, so the challenge is to go into these different jurisdictions and try to get an opportunity to, uh, because judges and lawyers have to take continued education credits. So to try to pe get people that can get qualified to provide these courses. Um, yeah, so um, actually, well, Carrie in the chat room mentioned about um, there was a bill that was put together um, and did not get passed in California trying to get mental health professionals um, education. Yeah, go ahead. It seems that you're, you're going to say This from California? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were familiar with that and working with some of the groups that were trying to get that through. Um, that, that's a, that was a very uh, good proposal um, to require that, that the divorce professionals be educated about these things. Um, 
Yeah, and then actually right now there's also a bill in Colorado that also talking about um uh yeah Lisa great um she's in Colorado yeah so right now there's a bill in Colorado that also talking about getting um education like you know um yeah mental health professional and also I think judges and uh, I don't remember the details of the bill but it's it also have that aspect of uh, let's make sure that people get education. But then again, this, these opponents are trying to say, but you can get education, but make sure that you do not touch parental alienation and parental alienation is junk science, which is such a dangerous thing because you already put this, um, before the professional, before the judges get a chance to learn about what parental alienation, you already put this in the bill saying, oh, by the way, it's junk science. So they never get a chance to even look at it to see what, what you know, and we have so much research on parental alienation. It's, it's 35 years of research. There's over a thousand scientific peer review publication on the topic on all these scientific magazines and journals, and yet, there's this bill being put out there so definitely we need help parents if you are in colorado um if you're an activist yeah we definitely need help um to do this but yeah it, it's really unfortunate and what really to me is it's so sad is that the organization that are pushing against this are people that are supposedly supporting um domestic violence victims of domestic violence um they somehow don't recognize that alienated parents are victims of domestic violence. Parental alienation is a form of domestic violence. It is a subset of domestic violence. A form of coercive control. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It is absolutely, it's, it's one parent using the child as a weapon to mm -hmm. try to control and destroy the other parent. So it is domestic violence. It's not punching, it's not hitting, it's not, uh, you know, but it is just the same. It is domestic violence. And yet these very groups that are supporting victims of domestic violence are the people that try to get the system to not recognize parental alienation, which is really puzzling to me. Yeah, so uh, we have a very good uh, uh, team in Colorado. Uh, one of them is on this, uh, this uh, working group. And uh, yeah, the working group has prohibited any references to parental alienation sort of from the outset yeah um, be, before we'll need to break before long before we do there's one more thing i wanted to share when we were on my website but i forgot to yes, when go we were ahead. There. Uh, with, yeah. let me do that here one of the things we've been doing is uh polling uh in states about attitudes toward uh, uh shared parenting towards equal shared parenting and uh, so we, we made another map here, which links the, the dark states of the states where we've done polling. And you know, someone was from California, someone on the call here is from California. Uh, let me go there. You, you click twice, once to expand it. And then, and these are the survey results in, in California. This was just done in, in January of this year. 93% of Californians say that it's in the child's best interest to have as much time as possible with each parent. 91% say they're more likely to vote for a candidate who supports children spending equal or nearly equal time with each of their parents. 83% indicated that they support a change in California law that awards children as much time as possible with each parent. And this is an important one, this next one. Um, one of the things I, I mentioned earlier is that people say, well, shared parenting might be fine unless there's conflict between the parents. Well. 78% um, of Californians believe that when there's conflict between the parents, awarding sole custody increases that conflict. Now, we also have, this is, this is a survey of people's attitudes, but we also have uh, research, uh, some of it done by, uh, or at least reported by Edward Crook in his book, The uh, Equal Parenting Presumption, um, which shows the way in which a sole custody award actually increases the conflict between the parents. Um, and it does that because it threatens one one parent's uh, relationship with the children, and, and when when they're threatened in this way, they you know sometimes become hostile. You know, so um, this is uh, this is really interesting. All of the dark states we have recent polling, and we have the results there. Um, the light states, will, if you click on those twice, it'll take you to a place where you can contribute to a poll being done in, in, in those states, and we have a one-page handout 
on uh, that, that summarizes some of the recent polling results in uh, the states where we've done it very recently. So this, these are also powerful tools to show to legislators and to the media about the um, uh, the desirability of shared parenting and, and how uh, politically feasible it is to do it. So this is under uh, at our website under work and the shared parenting poll. Wanted people to be sure. Excellent. To see that. So yeah. So parents, if you wanted to share your opinion about you know what you think about shared parenting, you um, that's the place that you can go in and contribute your opinion. Uh, the other things that I thought that was really helpful there is that you have a handout so that if you want to, you can print out that handout and then or email it to you know people that are running for position you know judges people that are getting elected in in official position you can show it to them and say hey you actually can use this as your platform you can actually win election because people support this so that's a really useful um handout to have for, for parents to have and yeah it's it's um that discussion that you mentioned about colorado it, it's so so frustrating to me um, because I, I mean, I'm very familiar with with that work group. So you know, there there was a child fatality that happened as a result of parental alienation. A child was killed by an alienator. Um, in fact, this is a case that we are working on for our documentary film. This is the story of our documentary film. Is this child was alienated severely? Uh, by his father, and then after a five year of a custody battle involving all organizations that you could think of, all type of agencies, child welfare in multiple states, police, district attorney, uh, you know, uh, there's probational officers, all of these people, all the court system, and the family court, the civil court, the criminal court, and then five years and they fail to do anything and they recognize parental alienation they use the term parental alienation in the by the department of health services they use the term in the police the, the police even said this is the worst case of child man, man, manipulation that you could think of this is while the child was still alive and yet still they couldn't figure out how to fix this they're still giving the custody to the alienator who's then alienated the child so the the mother end up losing over 200 days of of custody over the period of the last two years of his life so she didn't get to see the child for two years essentially and then um eventually they went to court and the final court date the court finally recognized and the court says this is very severe alienation we're gonna try to do make up time for the mother we're gonna get the mother to get a chance to see the child and so there's the judge said, okay, uh, I'm going to, I think this is what I'm going to do. And that very night, the father killed the child. And so the child got killed when the system had had so many warnings for this whole five year period, all these different organizations. So then they did an investigation on this. They created a child fatality investigation that took a whole year to do this investigation. And then they created this report. And at the, re end, at the end of the report, the conclusion was, you know, parental alienation was a big problem. And the problem is, there's a lack of recognition of parental alienation in the legislation. And we recommend that it need to be changed. So they then created this work group, this, this uh, task force to implement this investigation. And the task force, like you mentioned, immediately the very first day of the task force meeting, the domestic violence support groups go in and lobby to the point that this task group immediately said, going forward, we're never going to recognize the term parental alienation. Anyone ever mentioned will be banned from this group and like completely take this thing off course. And, and then now when I try to confront it, they argument is like well you know like the typical arguments that we have heard well we can't recognize parental alienation because you know we see a lot of cases where abusive father end up getting custody even though it's completely against the data the data show completely opposite what they said right it's so frustrating and then they also said well um you know uh, 
this task force was created not just based on that case. And in fact, we already was going to create it a task force anyway. So no, if that case is not re relevant, what, what is, it, it's so frustrating anyway. It is, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, Jose, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, he said his, his heart's broken. Um, and um, Pauline, thank you so much. So she said that this is such a serious form of child abuse and domestic violence. She has PTSD and her son has been traumatized and manipulated. Um, yeah, it's it's horrific. I mean, we've done, uh, we have a series where we interviewed adult children of parental alienation um, who share their experience. I mean, we have it every month uh, on the fourth weekend of the month. If you guys uh, haven't seen some of the past one, um, you can join the, the future one, but you can also, you know, check back on the video in the past. And it's, it's heartbreaking because this damaged the child for life because we have this attachment thing, right, with parents that teach you about how to love and how to, uh, how to survive, how to learn other coping skills in life and then when we are taught these wrong skills you grow up and then it create all this attachment style that is bad so you you start to attach to abusive people you start to look for love and attention in the wrong places and then you end up in the cycle just keep continuing right it's 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 horrible so how do parents get involved with your organizations how do parents get involved? Yes. So, um, if we have a chapter in your state, we'll put you in touch with the uh, with the leader of that chapter. Uh, if we don't have a chapter, there's a link where we, if you're interested in trying to form a chapter in your state, we have a link where we ask people to fill out a form so we can learn a little bit more about you, and then we'll contact you and talk to you. Um, we're not always able to create new chapters in states, I and mean, we have, you know, we're, we we are an all volunteer organization, and and so um, we've expanded rather rapidly over the past year. I think we added 11 or 12 chapters uh, last year. But uh, if, if we can, and if we can put together an appropriate team, then, then we can uh, start a chapter in your state. And uh, you know, different chapters are focused on, on different things, though, though almost all of them are really focused on legislative reform. Uh, but they're in different stages. Sometimes some of the organizations uh, are, are really just getting started, and some have been established and working with legislators for a while. One of the things that I um, should emphasize that, that can, can give us hope is that um, it doesn't take a huge organization to make these legislative changes. Um, there's a there, there's a quote from uh, the anthropologist Margaret Mead, who said, uh, never underestimate the ability of a small group of dedicated people to bring about change. In fact, that's the only way it's ever happened. And one of the things that Matt Hale, who led the charge in Kentucky, will tell you is that he didn't have an army of people. He had a few people who were very dedicated and were willing to put in some time and to talk to legislators and to write off ads for newspapers and so forth. And, and they made a sweeping change in Kentucky's law. So it can happen elsewhere. Oh, wonderful. That's, that's really good to know. Um, so yeah, so for parents, and Suzette, I see your question in the room, but I don't think I quite understand your question. You said, can you have access um, to the story? So I'm not sure. Feel free to message us on our Facebook, like Victim to Hero. Uh, Facebook page, and then I'll, you know, explain um, if I can get a little bit more clarification. I'm happy to help you with with that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I, uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. And parents, if you haven't joined our mailing list, please do so. It's on our website at victimtohero.com, and um, we have a lot of these. Uh, events and this was the first of our advocate series. Thank you so much, Dr. Huben, for joining us today. And um, please share this event for other people so that they can see the video. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thank you.